Dear reader, allow me to introduce you to my book. Though it might at first appear like many books you've come across, it is far from ordinary. You may, therefore, have some misunderstandings about its nature. The story that awaits you has not been fully told. In fact, its conclusion is not yet known, even to myself. It is in that way that my book is special. It is in that way that you are special. Without you, there is no story. Chapter one. Normal isn't what it used to be. This is a story about change. Nestled in a shallow valley is the town of Beacon Pines. Far from the town square, across the river, past the neglected welcome sign, a young boy walks alone at dawn. His name is Luca Van Horn, and like you, dear reader, he's here for a reason. Luca's closest friend. He possessed many fine qualities, but subtlety was not one of them. Rolo finally noticed the tears welling in his friend's eyes and the flowers on the grave. Wonderful! I had a good feeling about you from the moment you opened my book. That charm is a very special thing. Very special indeed. Keep hold of it for now. Its purpose will reveal itself soon enough. suspiciously. interlude. Remember that charm you found in the dandelion patch? There are more of those special charms to discover throughout Beacon Pines. They've been known to reveal themselves to those who are willing. Some of them can be found in this very house. Since Gran had moved in, the house was more peaceful, more orderly, and more covered in flowery fabric. One of his father's old stethoscopes. Luca had spent countless hours listening to anything and everything with it, 
Not for years, though. Fran had already lit the fire. She kept a warm house, as if by grandmotherly obligation. Just some dusty knickknacks. Luca paused at his parents' bedroom door. He just wasn't ready to go in yet. Luca tossed on his favorite old sweater. Even though it was the first day of summer, a chill still hung in the air. Grand's moving in meant that most of Luca's things had been crammed in the corner. Luca was somewhat annoyed by the situation. Grand's bed was undisturbed. Luca didn't mind that she had a habit of falling asleep in front of the fireplace. It meant that he could read late into the night. Grand had commandeered the upstairs closet when she moved in. Some things need shelter from a young boy's mischief, she said. An array of prepared meals crowded the refrigerator, each labeled with the day of the week. A pair of dull scissors, a broken can opener, a mostly empty bottle of glue, and some loose string. The only piece of furniture Gran had brought when she moved in was an old hutch. Oh my, this is quite exciting. I am now certain that you are the one I've been waiting for all these years. You'll recall I was a bit coy regarding the use of charms earlier. Excuse me, I tend to have a flair for the dramatic. You are about to encounter your first turning point. There are certain times in this tale when everything hinges on a single word. Step forth, dear reader. A sturdy old wheelbarrow. Young Luca would spend hours hiding in the bushes, waiting for a chance to jump out and startle his mother. She always enjoyed humoring him by feigning terror. Beginner's Guide to Gardening laid open on the bench. The less grand new, the better for everyone involved. first turning point without too much of a mess. That is the power of charms. A single word can change everything. I think it's time to introduce you to the Chronicle. The Chronicle is a record of the decisions you've made. You can see the turning point which has been revealed. At any time, you can use the Chronicle to go back and invoke different charms, creating new branches. Luckily for us, this is the one and only turning point where the charms won't dramatically alter fate. It's the perfect opportunity to experiment with rewriting things. We were just gonna go hide for the 
today. Traditionally, when one is trying to hide something, they avoid literally using the word hide. For a town that saw few visitors, the welcome was perhaps more grand than necessary. this valley had been a small mining outpost. It wasn't until Sharper Valentine built his fertilizer company that Beacon Pines was established. Over the next 30 years, the town had grown and prospered until the foul harvest and his sudden death. In the six years since, everyone was simply trying to get by. <laughs> Mayor Augustus Valentine was not. <laughs> Flustered, Gus instinctively loosened his tie. Mr. Sinclair continued snoring and lifted one eyelid just enough to see who it was, a tactic he often used to avoid undesirable conversation. from the pocket of his sweater vest and began to frantically jot something down on a clipboard. from the clipboard.
Whenever Luca saw his dad's chair by the pond, it reminded him of the days they'd pack up a couple of sandwiches and fish until sundown. Luca opened the tackle box and picked the perfect bait. Luca gently baited a feather onto the hook. Good for skimming the surface. Luca gently baited Good for skimming the Luca tied a shoestring to the hook. What fish could resist a nice shoestring? Luca gently bit Good for skim. The boys had a good thing going. As long as they kept old Jeff happy, they had an endless source of precious materials to add to the treehouse. After Luca's father had passed, Rollo became obsessed with them building their own Hank Atomic Star Scraper. It was some time before Luca realized it was Rollo's way of keeping him occupied. On certain nights, when the clouds were just right, the boys could tune into strange patterns of static. Rollo thinks it's aliens. He always thinks it's aliens. Luca's winter coat decommissioned for the summer. With the cold holding out longer than usual, he reconsidered its usefulness.
Holden Wilder ran the local paper of record, the Beacon Beacon. Miss Hatch could often be found near the fountain, too absorbed in a book to be distracted. Luca could see the morning regulars nestled in their booths at the early bean. Oh, right. Rendezvous with Roxy. This is an important turning point. The first time where your charms will change the course of fate. And currently, we only have one suitable charm at our disposal. Have no fear, we can always return later using the Chronicle once we find more charms. Well, now I'm just rambling. Where were we? <laughs> as Roxy took a step toward him, cracking her knuckles. Luca knew he had one chance to save his friend from being dragged home. In the past, he found the best way to deal with an enraged Roxy was to be a little chill.
Jeff's hardware closed down about a year ago. The effects of the foul harvest stretched wide. When there are no crops in the field, tractors don't need fixing. Thomas Gran regretted the second it was made. The phone booth was brand new, part of Perennial Harvest's Beacon Pines Reborn initiative. It didn't see much use. Luca peeked up at the beehive. It appeared to be deserted. The path led into a small hollow at the edge of Weepwood. The fence thrummed with a gentle electric buzz. Luca often asked himself what Rolla would do, so that he could rule out that option. As sparks flew from the fence, the light atop that section shut off. Two bulbs remained. One more to go. Luca knew that if he gave up now, he'd never hear the end of it from Rollo. Luca knew that if he gave The fence's buzzing gave way to silence. Every kid in town knew the old Valentine Fertilizer Building. Long abandoned, the warehouse once served as the industrial heart of Beacon Pines. Now, it stood only as a reminder of things left behind. The dormant building showed strange signs of life. There was only one way to find out. The water looked almost diseased. It flowed slowly into the woods. The hose emitted a subtle sound. It was actively draining some kind of liquid. <sighs> Luca thought he heard faint sounds coming from the other side of the door. He pressed his ear against the cold metal to hear better. The sound of footsteps grew louder. The heavy steel door knocked Luca to the ground. Disoriented, he looked up to see an imposing figure silhouetted in a green glow. It lunged toward him. He tried to scramble away, but felt a gloved hand latch onto his ankle. Luca watched his fingernails leave trails in the dirt as the hand slowly dragged him back through the door, into the lab, into the green light. 
This is a story about change. It was far from the sort of change Luca imagined for himself. But change is, after all, a dangerous animal. The end? I probably should have warned you about this. There are many paths that our story can take. Most will end in tragedy. But don't let that discourage you. We will find the ending that this story deserves. I just know it. From here on out, a charm will have a check mark when it's been used to its full potential at a given turning point. Now, let's try something different. In the past, he found the best way to deal with an enraged Roxy was to be a little shit. successor to the Valentine fortune, huffed as he brushed off his pants. Solomon trifled a gesture toward the approaching heiress, Valentine. glowing windows of the old warehouse came into view, Rollo began to bounce excitedly. Ooh, ooh, ooh. 
under the weight of the bag. <laughs> around at the large sack which burdened them. He snapped off a tag from just within a small zipper opening in the bag. Bo held the badge up to a faint shaft of light within the dumpster. as he ran. One, two, three. He pressed his ear to the dumpster wall, straining to hear Rollo's footsteps as they faded away. One, two, three. He pressed his ear to the dumpster wall, straining to hear Rollo's footsteps as they faded away. 15, 16, 17. He tried not to think about the contents of the dumpster as he counted. 35, 36, 37. The thick stench made it hard to breathe. Screw it, that's long enough. Luca carefully lifted the lid and peered out. Nothing. No sign of Rollo. No sign of the man in the yellow suit. Time to haul ass. Luca clambered from the dumpster, stumbling to his knees. He was up like a shot and running, sprinting toward home as fast as he could. Beacon Pines flew by, blurred by the tears that welled up in his eyes. He wouldn't remember getting home at all that night. 
throwing his front door open, storming up the stairs to his room and surrendering to sleep almost as abruptly as he hit his pillow. Chapter 3 Finding a Friend The next morning, it was quieter than usual at the breakfast table. Only the sound of silverware and chewing interrupted the awkward silence. Gran's brow furrowed. She let out a long sigh. Her voice was quiet and even. An eerie electronic sound echoed from Luca's bedroom. A pit formed in Luca's stomach. Luca's mouth felt dry. Luca could feel his heart beating in his throat. Beacon Pines was long and uninspiring, a sort of natural barrier for the impatient.
up from the clipboard excitedly. We all know Beacon Pines is a great town. What you may not know is great towns grow from mighty roots. And that is why you cannot tell the story of Beacon Pines without telling the story of one sharper Valentine. Young Sharper's keen intellect and strong moral fiber led to a grand vision. A vision of a community dedicated to a better tomorrow. In his own words, a better tomorrow is within our grasp, but it requires a singular mind to harness it. Lucky for us, he decided to grow that vision here, in Beacon Pine. And how does one grow a better tomorrow? With fertilizer, of course. Valentine's Fertilizer Company became the lifeblood of a town yearning for purpose. But then tragedy struck. A scientific experiment gone wrong. An accident which took Sharper away from us far too soon. To this day, we struggle to pick up the pieces. But one foul harvest isn't enough to stop the people of Beacon Pines. The spirit of Sharper Valentine lives on. It lives in the hearts of everyone with a dream for a better tomorrow. Together, we will follow his example and grow a bountiful future. Paid for by the Valentine family and the Valentine Fertilizer Company Riverman's Fund. Thank you. 
much, if you ask me. new additions. Simply, a variety of existing content rotated into the front display each week. Oh, the cobs I've eaten. A salad-centric travel guide for the mildly adventurous. Sally Seashore's simple succulent sundries. Luca brushed off a smudge of dust. Or... Maybe it's 30 recipes so easy you'll doubt it's even edible. A peek behind the curtain. The methods and ruminations of Patrick C. Montesquieu, one of the greatest acting minds of our time by Patrick C. Montesquieu. Psychological phosphorescence. The bottom corner shelf was a dusty array of thick science books. Only one binding was clean enough to read. Cellular biology and the chemistry of mitosis. of the library was devoted to comics, most of which were Hank Atomic and the myriad of lesser, revered spin-offs. Cotto volunteered at the library during the summers. He wasn't very social, so he'd dedicate each summer to becoming an expert in a single subject, making him a reliable source of very particular knowledge. If you were to ask Kato something he didn't know, he'd escape into the dusty old bookshelves and return with just the right thing. Kato was lost in his reading. Luca crooked his neck to see the title. Introduction to Melatology. He gestured to the shelves. to establish any real connections. She would tell you she prefers it that way. Luca shifted his feet uncomfortably. Thank you. 
After the foul harvest destroyed their wealth and reputation, the Valentines shuttered off their estate from the rest of town. The Valentine Mansion loomed over every other building in town, both figuratively and literally. Luca felt a chill as he approached Beck. Her eyes were locked on the strange green liquid. The nearby grass was coated in a fine layer of frost. as Beck dipped a broken tree branch into the goo. Beck's eyes widened as flowers grew from the dead wood. First small buds, which quickly bloomed into vibrant petals. As quickly as they had grown, the flowers began to shrivel and turn gray. Beck dropped the stick with a grunt of disgust. Iggy took a step towards Luca, his sneer lit by the glowing puddle. Beck could see tears welling in Luca's eyes, his fists clenched. Some things about Beacon Pines were very different from the city, but a bully from a hayseed town is really no different from a city bully. Beck took a deep breath and thought. Well, time to bust out the strange. Beck stared in silence, the only sign of life being the twitch of an eye. taunting back, something in Luca snapped. Iggy's smirk shifted to a look of shock as Luca launched himself into his stomach. Iggy's clothes were drenched in the glowing ooze. Iggy's voice began to slur as he struggled to get up. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Well, time to bust out the tickles. Beck lunged forward and began to tickle under Tish's arms. Tears began to form in Tish's eyes as she gasped for breath between gales of laughter. Beck redoubled her efforts until Tish finally had had enough. <laughs> Iggy's eyes darted around, a realization dawning on his face that he was now outnumbered. <laughs> Iggy kicked at the puddle before making his escape. Beck shook the ooze out of her hair as best as she could. Chapter 4 The Best Policy Luca paused for a moment, catching his breath. He'd only just met Beck, and somehow he already managed to drag her into this mess. Hopefully he could make it up to her. But finding Rolla was his primary concern. and Fitz looked drained. It was clear they'd spent all day searching. <laughs> Roxy's temper could often be dismissed as the impatience of an older sibling. But this was the most intense Luca had ever seen her. Her eyes were wild and unfocused, looking straight through Luca. <laughs> In a torrent of rambled words and tears, Luca broke down. Roxy, still exhausted and angry, softened briefly as her eyes hunted the ground in thought. With a determined sigh, she looked up at Luca. <laughs> Roxy drew herself up. <laughs> Roxy tried to think of the safest place to send Luca. <laughs> Luca wiped his cheeks and gave a quick nod. Looking into the puddle, Roxy rubbed her arms to warm up. Mr. Nuncree jumped with a start.
Luca motioned to the phone booth. Mr. Nuncree gently placed one of his substantial hands on Luca's shoulder. Luca peered up at Mr. Nuncree. Kind eyes warmed a stern face. There was a deeper emotion hiding beneath it all. It was subtle, but Luca could sense something eating away at him. a shame lurking behind those eyes. A deep sadness. If Mr. Nuncreed was that worried about Rollo, maybe he could help. Mr. Nuncreed raised an eyebrow. Nuncreed's shoulders slumped. A deep sigh bellowed from his chest. Luca attempted to take a step back, but Nuncreed's hand clamped down on his shoulder. With a firm shove, Nuncreed manhandled Luca into the phone booth. The door latched shut with a mechanical hiss. As Luca pounded the glass, the floor dropped from under his feet. The inside of the phone booth was now a loose capsule plummeting at gravity's whim. Luca winced and pressed his hands to the walls. As he braced for impact, the capsule hurried to a surprisingly smooth stop. He felt a cold rush of air and opened his eyes with hesitance. Two large figures in hazmat suits occluded his view. Luca heard the deep, resigned voice of Mr. Nuncreed over an intercom. He knows too much. The end. Wait. No. This isn't the end. I know there's still much more. Somehow this went wrong. Okay, let's try something else. This is a story about struggle. Luca could hear a machine humming somewhere nearby. He felt around wildly, searching for something, anything that could help. His hands found a hard object, maybe a tile? He yanked it free, lifting the cold stone. Let me go! Luca swung the tile as hard as he could at the shape that still held fast to his leg. He heard the crack of glass as the stone hit the assailant's mask. With a muffled yelp, the hand let go. Luca was free and scrambled to the door. He never looked back once on the long run home. Chapter 3 Everything's fine. The next morning, it was quieter than usual at the breakfast table. Only the sound of silverware and chewing interrupted the awkward silence. <laughs>
of his sandals. Valentine, oldest of Sharper Valentine's children and heir to the Valentine fortune, had a way of making questions seem like demands. Mr. Wilder had learned to assume that if he was hearing from Eris, it was because she had taken issue with something he had put in the paper. Mr. Wilder averted his gaze and began to polish his monocle. Lucas Cheek. jars of jam. Thank <laughs> you. 
his counter, Hiram Tolliver was meticulously shining apples. More accurately, Hiram Tolliver was meticulously shining one apple. With a yelp, Mr. Tolliver fumbled the apple, flailing at the air as it fell. He leaned forward and lowered his voice. He leaned in a bit further. Mr. Tolliver leaned back, speaking loud enough for anyone to hear. He reached forward and snapped up the jars of jam, giving Luca a little wink. He leaned in for a final whisper. to the book in front of him. Mr. Nuncreed eyed Luca for a moment, then nodded in agreement. Nuncreed snatched the basket from Luca. Beck locked eyes with Luca. The look on her face was equal parts expectant and desperate. Beck gave Luca a quick nudge.
Jeff dug through his pockets for a bit. took a long breath, then gave a firm nod. Chapter 4 Dinner with the Moodwills Ilona Moodwill was worried about change, a gardener at heart. She understood the necessity of change, relied on it even. But there was a difference between the controlled world of her plants and this cluttered cottage in a strange town. Almost done! Nellie was a blur of activity, digging through boxes. Sorry, love. Couldn't find the dishes. We'll have to make do with paper plates. Dinner went by without much conversation. As she watched Beck and Luca finish up their pizza, Ilona let herself relax into the chair. The things she cared about were still here. Nellie finally had the job of her dreams. Beck was beginning to take root. Ilona's task was simply to tend to them. She could do that. Luca's eyes were fixed to his plate, pushing a chunk of pineapple around with his finger. Nelly was the one who eventually broke the silence. Ilona nervously gestured toward the boxes. Luca wiped his face with his sleeve. Beck gave Luca a swift kick under the table. Luca glanced over to Beck. She seemed to be holding her breath. Beck slammed her fist into the table. Perhaps harder than she intended. Luca glanced outside to gauge the time. The sky was darker than he expected, filled with ominous clouds. 
Luca wiped his mouth one last time with his napkin and started to get up. Surprised, Luca turned around. He knew Rollo could be prickly around new people. But Beck seemed cool. Rolla would warm up to her eventually. Probably. Luca began to respond, but the sky answered for him as the clouds above began to rumble with ominous thunder. Luca surveyed the roiling clouds. At that moment, the heavens opened up, unleashing torrential rain. squinted into the eye hole of the microscope. Luca adjusted the slide with his fingers to get a better look. Luca wiped his hand off on his sweater and gave a nervous laugh. Beck looked down, timidly tapping the ladder with her feet. flicked at one of the toggles. Luca bent down to examine the bouquet of wilting flowers. Judging by the odor, they were well past their prime. He flipped open the attached card. Watch the rivulets of water running down the window. Luca took a deep breath, exhaling slowly. Luca let out a feral 
dull scream that echoed into the night. As it began, the storm abated. Beck gave Luca a light thump on the arm before heading in. Chapter 5 Friendly Feud The air was heavy with a hard rain's residue the smell of wet things. Despite his dreary surroundings, Luca felt at peace. He'd never shared those details about his dad with anyone. Not even Rollo. But it's not like this changed anything. Rollo was still his best friend. Adding Beck to the group would help balance things out. Everything's better in threes. This is what Luca told himself as he headed to the treehouse. Luca had only ever heard him speak in this stiff yet gentle tone a few times, and it always meant one thing. Rollo scoffed. stumbled on his words, knowing he'd said too much. Luca 
Bill became instinctively angry in response. Both boys were now shouting across the distance. Ooh. Ooh. through his old stuff, not even sure what he was looking for. Gran cooed gently from the hallway. Luca just wanted to be alone. He waited to hear the sound of the front door closing. to go out. Besides, if he ran into Rolo, he'd have to actually confront the situation. The Adventures of Hank Atomic. Luca carefully opened the cover and began to read. Rolo had received it for his birthday, a special hardcover edition with behind-the-scenes commentary and bonus art. Rolo cherished it, but asked that Luca keep it at his house. Luca wasn't sure if it was because Rolo didn't trust himself with it, didn't trust his sister around it, or just wanted an excuse to come hang out at Luca's more often. Whatever the reason, Luca didn't mind, but it had stayed right there where Rolo had stashed it ever since. Now, at the foot of his bed, Luca lost himself in the pages. He'd read it all before, but at this moment, it somehow felt sentimental. He was well into issue number five when he heard soft footsteps from the hallway.
Without realizing it, Luca had pouted away the entire afternoon. He once again felt the weight of it all and allowed his weary eyes to close. Luca stood in a vast black expanse. He looked up at his father standing beside him. Walt was working a straw at the bottom of a fountain glass, trying to collect the last bits of milkshake. Dad? Where are we? Taking a final loud gurgling sip, his father peered up from the glass. He jangled the straw playfully with a warm smile, then lifted the empty glass as if to point into the darkness. The source? Luca's eyes followed his father's gesture. In an instant, he was sitting in front of a blazing campfire. Across from him sat a large figure in a yellow hazmat suit. The figure's voice was a scratchy echo. Well, if it isn't the man of the hour. Make yourself comfortable. Luca held his shivering hands over the flame to warm himself. It doesn't work that way here. Their yellow-gloved hand pointed to the base of the flame. It's a cold flame. See? Luca peered at the base of the fire. It wasn't wood that was burning. It was Beacon Pines itself. Tiny buildings, freezing and crumbling as they were consumed by flame. Luca could see small shadows moving in the burning city. People. Luca leapt to his feet. We've got to help them! The figure gave a dismissive wave of their hand. Why waste energy helping people who can't even help themselves? The figure bent down to examine the panicked crowd as they desperately tried to stop the flames. They only care about what's right in front of them. Not like us. Luca's voice was a trembling whisper. Us? The figure slowly stood up, grabbing its helmet with both hands. With a jolt and a twist, the suit emitted a gasp. A cloud of torpid mist escaped, slowly revealing the face within. Luca's own face looked back at him. Older, worn, distant. The sensation was oddly familiar, as if he'd caught his own reflection by surprise in the mirror. The doppelganger smiled. I tried to help once. He gestured towards his face. And all it got me was this. Luca staggered back. You? Luca felt a hand catch his shoulder. His father was there again, beside him. Every choice sets us on a path. This is the end of one of your paths, son. Luca watched his older self shake its head ruefully, its face twisting into a cruel grin. Well, Dad, if you wanted him to see this, far be it from me to disappoint. Luca watched in shock as the figure took a confident step forward and plunged into the flames in a flash of cold light. He was gone. What does all of this mean? Luca felt a reassuring squeeze on his shoulder. Just remember why we choose matters just as much as what we choose. Luca woke up to see a hazy figure at the foot of his bed, silhouetted in the morning sun. Luca rubbed his eyes. The kind, concerned face of his gran came into focus. Grand silenced Luca with a gentle pat on the leg. Luca gave a reluctant nod. Luca 
took a deep breath. Chapter 6 Through Thick and Thin Despite Lucas' bitterness, Gran was right. He needed to hash things out with Rollo. A big fight changes the nature of a friendship. Whether, in the end, it is for the better or for the worse, all comes down to understanding. If one is not careful, the same familiarity that builds the strongest of bonds can become the wrecking ball that shatters them. Luca emerged from seclusion, taking in the crisp festival air. But the events of the day weren't on his mind. He had to find Rollo. Roxy rolled her eyes, shaking her head. Luca looked down and kicked at the dirt. to his grinning mouth. staring into the distance with a wistful look. <laughs> Jeff turned to Luca with a furrowed brow, then gave an understanding nod. For a moment, the two now shared that same wistful gaze. became flesh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
suspiciously. grabbed the modern science of atomic radiation from the shelf. Luca grabbed The Adventures of Hank Atomic, issue number four, from the shelf. Luca grabbed The Adventures of Hank Atomic, issue number five, from the shelf. Kato removed his book from the desk and replaced it with Luca's, turning on the lamp. As he slid the book under the purple light, two words glowed. The Adventures of Hank Atomic, Issue 5. Luca clicked his tongue with recognition. his sentence, Griffin handed him a corn dog. Luca shrugged, taking a sizable bite out of the corn dog. Luca tongued at his cheeks, feeling something rough between his teeth. He reached into his mouth and pulled out a slip of paper. He shook off the bits of corn dog to read the slip. off the remainder of the corn dog. sarcastically as he began.
sheepishly handed Luca the balloon. Luca threw himself at Rollo, hugging him as tightly as he could. Sadly, 
distant rumble shook the treehouse. It was not fireworks. It was something the boys couldn't possibly comprehend. Something as old and cruel as time. through the room, a bitter, unfathomable chill. Before they could react, it encased them in ice. Two boys, reunited by friendship, only to be cruelly separated by a malevolence beyond reason. And so, our story ends on this melancholy scene, in a silent treehouse turned statuary, in a town brought low by its secrets, sits a pair of friends alone, together, for the rest of time. The end. No, that can't be the ending. It simply can't. I won't accept it, and I hope you won't either. There are more endings, more possibilities. I, I can feel it. We are just going to have to sort through them all until we find the one that fits. Luca began to respond, but the sky answered for him as the clouds above began to break, revealing patches of star-filled summer night. Moonlight filtered down, shimmering in the treetops. Luca stopped himself mid-sentence. the gate. Beck grabbed the wrought iron bars and shook the gate. was an excited whisper. out from all corners. A chill ran down Luca's spine. His vision blurred. Beck stifled a sharp wince, and Luca looked down to see himself wrenching her hand. Gran tussled her hair back under the face mask. you have. Lucas sat shivering in the bushes, staring at his feet. 
After checking to make sure the coast was clear, Beck gave him a gentle tug on his sweater. finished writing with a scratchy flourish and looked up. Mr. Nuncreed, arms crossed over his paunch, gave an exhausted sigh. He snatched the pad and scribbled his name so hard the pen nearly snapped. looked at each other for a moment, almost pondering the possibility, then broke into laughter as they walked away. William Kerr and Gus Valentine proudly surveyed the half-covered festival banner. The mayor gave a half-hearted shrug. on Gus's shoulder. With a glimmer in his eye, Kerr gestured grandly toward the horizon. Thank you. 
waggled his head with pride. shot back a look. Ooh. 
Chapter 6 Secret Lair Summer forged ahead, but the nights only seemed to grow colder. Luca walked home slowly under the pale starlight, cautious to avoid any more surprises lurking in the shadows. Reaching home, he slipped quietly into bed, half dreading what they might discover the next day. Luca and Beck rolled their eyes as Rollo strutted across the room. Rollo flung open the cabinet with confidence. He coughed as a veil of dust hit his face. A look of realization crept onto Luca's face. All three kids snapped to glance at each other, then sprinted in turn toward the kitchen. Before he could finish, Luca scrambled up Rollo's back. The three crowded around the hutch to peer in. With the glass doors opened, a perfect porcelain display gleamed in front of them. Their eyes searched for anything amiss, but the only distinct feature was its impeccability. As Beck pulled on one of the teacups, it slanted forward with a hollow click. The entire hutch began to rustle and slide under its own power. Luca jostled each cabinet drawer in turn. Only one was unlocked. He fingered through the filing cabinet, pausing at a bulging folder labeled Walter. For a long moment, he just stared at it. Luca nodded and caressed the label with his thumb. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh. Rollo swiped
swiped the folder from the drawer and began leafing through the pages. He whistled to himself, barely looking at the text. He stopped at a page and mimed, holding up a monocle. Rolla looked up with heightened surprise. Rolo's finger traced across the page. Rolo scanned through several more pages. Luca, staring blankly at the cabinet this whole time, spoke softly. Rolo rustled the folder, trying to lose more pages. Luca frantically shoved the remaining cabinet folders, trying to find another labeled Walter. Luca slammed the drawer shut. A spider web of string connected photos of people from the town, interspersed with hastily scrawled notes. Rollo casually spun open a lid and dipped his finger in the jam. He smacked his lips. Rollo plunged his hand in the jar, fishing out a soggy slip of paper. Rollo offered the slimy note to Luca and licked his fingers clean. They crowded around a worn-down old map of Beacon Pines. Rollo carefully traced the path with his finger. He jabbed down at the end point. Ooh. 
Luca looked up from the map. Beck flicked off the light, and they became statues in the dark. Overhead, creaking floorboards bent under slow, deliberate steps. The kids looked up, the tilt of their necks following each footfall. Suddenly, it stopped. Without realizing, they'd been holding their breath. All three exhaled shakily and glanced at each other. A muffled male voice broke the silence. A final few footsteps reached the entrance above them, and the voice now echoed down the stairs. The three kids shuffled to the corners without a peep. As he began to descend the stairs, the man's voice punctuated every new step. Thump. 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 At the bottom step, the man paused, squinting to search the room for signs of life. Rolo shifted suddenly. Luca gave him an intense, chastising look and whispered through clenched teeth. It was too late. Rollo was already inching toward the stairway. He screeched as he charged toward the shadowy figure. With all his weight, Rollo tackled the man to the ground. From the dark corner, they saw something move. Luca scrambled to the hunched figure on the ground. Pressing his fingers to the man's neck, he sighed with relief. As Beck flicked back on the light, Luca and Rollo both gasped in stereo. Chapter 7 the Interrogation of Hiram Tolliver Still unconscious, Mr. Tolliver slumped heavily in a shoddy old chair. His hands were bound with rope, his feet tied with some loose string. The kids huddled in a circle, discussing their plan. One thing was certain, they couldn't just let Mr. Tolliver go. They needed to know what he was doing in Luca's house. After some deliberation, it was decided. They'd run the classic good cop, hard cop interrogation. Rollo brandished a steely gaze. I've got this. Read about it a hundred times. Rollo swaggered past the chair which propped up the slumping Hiram Tolliver. Without even looking at his captive, he began with a long, blustery drawl. <laughs> Mr. Tolliver remained motionless. Rollo spun around to face him. He'd clearly expected to rouse Mr. Tolliver with his booming voice. Beck and Luca gave each other an unsure glance. Rollo slammed his fist on the table. He grabbed the table lamp and beamed it onto the unconscious face. Mr. Tolliver groaned and slowly lifted his head. He recoiled with a muddled, weary squint. Uh, uh, uh. The chair wobbled as he attempted to straighten up. Uh, uh, uh. Mr. Tolliver could only make out rough shapes through the glaring light. With a gruff tone, Rollo hoped to both conceal his voice and intimidate. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, 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 uh. Ooh. 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 Ooh.
The doubtful expression on Beck and Luca's faces transformed into awe. Rollo, hitting his stride, was now channeling every detective trope his memory could recall. He slammed the table again. Mr. Tolliver's voice became desperate. He was nearly in tears. Mr. Tolliver was in a daze, now more confused than ever. He shook his head, feeling more and more dizzy. His voice faded to a whisper. With that, Mr. Tolliver passed out cold. Rollo swung around with a repentant grimace. Chapter 8 Six feet under, three towns over The kids spent the rest of the afternoon combing through dusty piles of old county records, desperately searching for anything that could help them make sense of Mr. Tolliver's cryptic utterance. Luca tried to shake the thought of Grand's basement, but his focus wavered. Explosives, messages hidden in jam, dossiers on various town figures, and a corkboard threaded with photos. Gran was the only family he had left. He still couldn't bring himself to believe the worst. But the old map with the symbol of explosives in Town Square made that difficult. As the sun began to set, the kids were no closer to the truth. with an assertive nod. Rollo muttered under his breath. her finger down on the open page before glancing down to read. 
Something tickled the back of Luca's mind. The question hung in the air. Beck rubbed her eyes. Luca's heart was pounding as he approached the house. If he was lucky, Gran, or whoever it was, hadn't gotten back yet. And of course, there was Mr. Tolliver tied up and unconscious in the basement. Dealing with him would be the first order of business. Luca shook out his arms to calm his nerves before entering. He held perfectly still, tempering his breath and listened closely. She was asleep. His only hope was that she hadn't found Mr. Tolliver before dozing off. was nowhere to be seen. Or maybe Gran knew everything. Luca's hungry stomach groaned. Not realizing it, he'd gone the entire day without eating. Luca rushed over to the pile of jam jars, unscrewed one, and shoveled a handful into his mouth. the lid to read the label. As Luca climbed the final stair, the emotion of the day dragged heavily on him. With each consecutive step, his legs weakened. His stride began to falter. He tried to grab for the railing to steady himself. Something was wrong. Luca groaned and tried to move. His limbs might as well have been bolted to the ground. Through numb lips, he mumbled just before falling asleep. Chapter 9 A Speech to End All Speeches Luca awoke to find himself face down in bed. He moaned into his pillow. Why would Gran drug him? Or rather, why was she trying to drug Mr. Nuncreed? Shaking the questions from his woozy head, Luca snapped back to the matter at hand.
Augustus Valentine nervously wiped his brow. Gus cleared his throat and awkwardly loosened his tie. <laughs> William Kerr bounded on the stage with the energy of a preacher at a big tent revival. He gave Gus a hearty slap on the back and motioned him off the stage. Mr. Kerr pulled a thick stack of note cards out from his vest. each word. Mr. Kerr nodded confidently, biting his lip. The crowd was silent, in rapt attention. Mr. Kerr methodically made eye contact with each section of the crowd. began to build to a crescendo. The crowd began to look around nervously. Mr. Kerr quickly flicked through his note cards. up to the heavens. At that moment, a merciless wall of impossibly cold air ripped through the crowd, instantly freezing everyone and everything it touched. For a man like William Kerr, this was a fitting way for things to end. On a stage, with an entire town frozen in rapt attention, for the rest of time. The end. There's that ice again! Whenever I think we're getting close, it comes along and ruins everything. Maybe we should just quit? Maybe you should just close the book, walk away, and never think of me again. No, I... I don't mean that. We got a little closer this time. We just need to try again. Please. They'd run the classic good cop, sly cop interrogation. Luca and Rollo ducked behind a barrel, leaving Beck to her task. With a few crisp snaps, she roused Mr. Tolliver. Uh, 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 uh. 
Mr. Tolliver looked down and shifted a bit, testing his restraints. Beck caught herself before letting the surprise manifest on her face. She'd already gotten him to reveal his relation to Gran. This was going to be easy. Mr. Tolliver wriggled a bit in his restraints. Beck quickly removed the ropes. Mr. Tolliver rubbed the growing knot on his forehead. Beck twirled her hand, as if to prompt Mr. Tolliver to finish her thought. Beck shook her head and clicked her tongue. Mr. Tolliver let out an amused huff in agreement. Beck was on a roll now, playing Mr. Tolliver like a fiddle. Heading for the stairs, Mr. Tolliver hesitated and turned to Beck with a puzzled look. She grinned and gave him a peppy wave. With a shrug, he continued up the stairs, whistling a jaunty tune. Beck blinked slowly in disappointment. She turned to the table and began tearing small scraps of paper. Beck marked each scrap of paper and leaned back. Luca and Beck looked at Rollo with amazement. around nervously. Thank you. 
Solomon stood proudly at the entrance to the drugstore, holding a brown bag overflowing with black licorice. Solomon shoveled a surprising amount of licorice into his mouth. on the glass to peek inside. Beck flung open the door and they all squeezed in. Luca cracked his knuckles and entered the letters into the keypad. of the phone booth dropped loose from its shell. Without even the space to panic, they closed their eyes, held their breath, and accepted their fate. Suddenly, the chaotic descent slowed to an effortless landing. It was unclear where they ended up, but at least it was solid ground. The air was stagnant and smelled vaguely of chlorine.
Joseph waited for a moment in silence. He gestured toward the strange tubes.
in town square. They spotted Mr. Nungreed inching cautiously toward a pit at its center. He held his arms out gingerly, as if approaching a beast in the wild. Upon closing the distance, Luca recognized what Nungreed was after. Graham stood confidently at the edge, one arm outstretched over the abyss. Nearby, a wheelbarrow had been emptied out. She held a lit torch, which flickered in the bitter wind. growing louder. <laughs> Mr. Nuncreen winced with anguish. His voice hardened. They both now yelled, not to each other but at fate itself, making their peace with long-held burdens. The wind howled with encouragement. They menaced at each other, both catching their breath. The moment balanced on a knife's edge. Amid a blur of emotions and memories, Luca's mind flooded with questions. The wind calmed, as if to give him the stage. And in the stillness, he began to weep. It was all just too much. Falling to his knees, Luca whimpered softly. The tears crystallized as they hit the snow. Gran stared at Luca for a moment with warm sympathy, remembering why this was all necessary. She stiffened up and brandished the torch at Mr. Nuncreed. Ignoring his final plea, Gran flung the torch into the deep darkness. She smiled and exhaled in relief. Mr. Nuncreed moaned in resignation. The torch echoed as it ricocheted down the hole, punctuated with a thunderous thud. Before Gran could finish, the ground shook her to silence. time to spin around and run to Luca. Her attempt to shield him, an honorable but trifling act. Unflinching love, pitted against an unthinking horror. There was no contest. Her warm embrace froze in an instant. That is where they remain, fixed in place, forever. And so, our story ends on this melancholy scene. In a town brought low by its secrets, sits the frozen statues of a misguided band of meddlers. The end. Well, that 
was dire. On the bright side, we finally figured out where all the ice is coming from. Now, we just need to find a way to deal with a mystic, unfathomable force of nature. to Iggy. Was Rolo caught up in all of this? glanced toward Luca. Rolo was safe. A wave of relief washed over Luca, which was quickly replaced by a sense of dread. Gran is going to kill me. If he hurried, he might just make it home before sundown. Chapter 4 our harvest awaits. Luca took a deep breath and gingerly opened the door, stealing himself for Gran's wrath. Luca was alone. The house was empty. Luca was sitting by the pond, listening to small waves lap against a rock. His father sat in a folding chair in front of him. Without turning, he spoke. Why don't you grab me some nice bait? Sure thing, Dad. Luca hopped over to the tackle box and popped open the lid. Inside was a rolling, buzzing mass. We're fishing with bees? Luca's father gave a warm chuckle. Well, you catch more fish with bees than honey. Pick us out a good one. Luca closed his eyes and plucked out a bee. He could feel its wings struggle between his finger and thumb. Holding it at arm's length, he hurried over. His father deftly baited the hook and examined his work. Interesting choice. With a practiced flick of the wrist, the line buzzed in a graceful arc. The water accepted it without a splash or ripple. The wrong choice, but I respect it. The pond began to freeze over. Sometimes we gotta make the wrong choice before we can make it right. Pallid ice propagated across the still surface with an alarming speed. Luca scrambled back as the ground beneath him turned cold. Dad, I don't understand. Sorry, kiddo. Understanding isn't always part of the deal. 
The relentless ice shot through the fishing line toward his father. Dead, look out! His father casually wound the reel. None of it's your fault, you know. Never was. Dad, we have to go! Luca grabbed his father's shoulders, trying to pull him away. Please, you have to run! The ice crackled as it spread across his father's hands. That's the thing about fishing, Luca. His chest began to crystallize. You toss your hook in, and you never know what you're gonna pull out. A shock of searing cold ran up Luca's arms. He gave one last desperate tug. The chair tipped backwards in a single frozen mass. Luca tried to stop the momentum, but it was too late. He watched the icy form of his father slam into the hard ground, shattering into a thousand pieces that crowded around his feet. Dad, I don't understand. What does all this mean? The gentle rustle of leaves was the only reply. Luca's eyes struggled to focus on the walkie-talkie. Faintly, he could hear Rollo amongst the noise. Rollo's voice was coming through more clearly now, but some words were still just static. signal went silent. Luca held still, waiting for a response, his pounding heartbeat marking the passage of time. Rollo's voice began to fade. With that, the signal died for good. Luca grabbed the walkie-talkie and sprinted to the treehouse. Luca heard a group of footsteps approaching. He dashed behind the bushes to avoid being spotted. Mr. Tolliver paused, shifting his eyes to one side. <laughs> Mr. Tolliver took one long, quiet breath. <laughs> The three shared a determined look.
two boys shared a mischievous grin. shifted slowly from behind the rocket, revealing itself to Luca. Luca reached over empathetically. Iggy's tone jolted to dejected anger. Luca slumped to the ground, overwhelmed by guilt. talkie and headed for the window. Luca and Iggy climbed up the back of the treehouse to its roof, where Rollo had constructed his MCDC, the Mission Control Defense Cannon. From behind the crowd of clipboards, William Kerr strode forward, a warm smile on his face. mind raced. He was caught in a trap. What do you do? 
do when there's no hope? He wiped his cheeks with a sleeve. What are you gonna do, Luca? Luca drew himself up and decided to take the only option they had left. Fight. He swung the mission control defense cannon around, aiming it confidently at the smirking face of William Kerr. Luca summoned his most insolent demeanor. Kerr turned his back on the two boys. With a nonchalant wave of the hand, he made his exit. As the clipboards began to slowly advance on the treehouse, Luca looked to Iggy with resignation in his eyes. The end. That escalated quickly. Maybe discretion was the better part of valor here. Luca drew himself up and decided to take the only option they had left. Flight. He squinted down the barrel of the mission control defense cannon, aiming it through an opening in the dense tree branches. He looked up with surprise as it struck true and taut. through the thicket. The branches clawed at them, reluctant to give passage. After what felt like a marathon, Luca stopped in his tracks as they reached the clearing. What the? That was all he was able to say before Iggy slammed into his back. The boys tumbled down a steep decline and crashed with a wheezing thud on a surface as hard as ice. In fact, it was ice. Chapter 5 Signs they stood silently, catching their breath. The sky was like sapphire. With each breath, a plume of steam escaped from Luca's lungs. Let's keep moving. Luca pulled Iggy to his feet as they gazed across a snowy terrain. forgotten the walkie-talkie he was carrying. <laughs> Luca looked at Iggy with hesitation. With a resigned sigh, Luca responded. walkie-talkie back into his pocket. <laughs> A disc of smooth metal was lightly covered in snow. Two faint seams were visible along the surface. <laughs> Thank you. 
stream, Luca could faintly see a school of minnows encased in the ice. The crunching of footsteps trailing Luca went hush. He looked back to see Iggy's face twisted with confusion. Yawn. 
Luca's eyelids begin to slowly drift shut. That's all Luca could whisper before succumbing to sleep. Iggy snuggled in some more. The house smelled of warm bread. Luca was playing with toy blocks on the living room rug. He looked up to see his parents on the couch. His mother held his father's head in her lap. She idly stroked his hair while humming a song. A voice behind Luca spoke. This is how you remember them, huh? Luca turned to see his own face. The doppelganger from his dreams, still clad in a yellow hazmat suit, still carrying a look of disdain behind empty eyes. Aww, look at this perfectly cozy scene. You know it wasn't really like- The figure picked up a toy block and inspected it. It's amazing the facades that one can build given the right materials. Not that I blame us. These are a child's memories. You don't remember, do you? Luca snatched the block from the figure's yellow gloved hand. Remember what? The doppelganger pointed to the couch. The last day we saw him alive. The day he chose to abandon us. Luca turned to look at his father, still lounging on the couch. That's not true. He didn't abandon us. The doppelganger waved his hand dismissively. Everything is true here. It's just a matter of what we choose to see. Well, let me show you. The world flickered and pulsed. Luca was sitting next to his bed, listening to his heartbeat with one of his dad's stethoscopes. The doppelganger limped into the room. No, no, we both know that's not how this went. He grabbed Luca's hand and guided the stethoscope to the floor. Luca heard muffled shouting, brought close by the stethoscope. It was his parents, fighting. Do you remember what we did next? Luca gave a slow nod and crept down the hall to peek through the- He could see the outline of his mother at the bottom of the stairs. Damn it, Walt. We can't afford to get involved in this. She was scared. His father stepped forward. What am I supposed to do? Just watch? There's a sickness in this town, and we both know who's behind it. I swore an oath to help people. I won't turn my back on them. Luca's mother grabbed Walt. She was crying, pleading. I can't lose you. Walt calmly removed Eleanor's hand from his shoulder. What's right is right, and what's wrong is wrong. I could never live with myself if I let Sharper get away with this. Eleanor raised her voice. Spare me your bullshit platitudes. What about our son? Luca flinched, dropping the stethoscope down the stairs. Walt turned with a panicked smile. Luca? Is that you, buddy? With tears in his eyes, Luca descended the stairs. Mom? Dad? What's going on? Walt dropped to a knee to meet Luca eye to eye. Nothing, buggeroo. Your mom and I just got a little overexcited is all. Luca placed the stethoscope against his father's chest. His heart was racing. It sounded like you were going somewhere. Walt gently removed the device from Luca's ears. Listen to me, Luca. I have some business to take care of. I'll be back in time to tuck you in. Luca hugged his father tightly. Promise? Walt stood up and walked to the door. He glanced over his shoulder. I promise. With a wink and a grin, he put on his hat and strode out into the evening sun. A figure approached soundlessly from the foggy snowfall. It stood above them, lingering in contemplation. Slowly raising one hand above Iggy, it snapped out two brisk wraps on his head. From a deep slumber, Iggy sprang up defensively. Whether it was the calming presence or the recognition that he was not in danger, Iggy felt his clenched fists lower. Luca looked up, gradually remembering his whereabouts. The figure exhaled a cloud of warm vapor.
When it came to complete strangers, Icky had trouble cobbling together an insult. Iggy huffed with gratification. <laughs> Nat began to turn away indifferently. <laughs> Iggy turned sharply and began to stomp off. Realizing he'd worn their patience then, Nat relented. Luca and Iggy turned around with hope in their eyes. Nat took a deep breath in. Nat exhaled slowly, then snapped his fingers. For a brief moment, Luca and Iggy let themselves believe that some great magic was about to unfold. Until they opened their eyes and found themselves in the exact same place. Cold and disheartened. narrowed his eyes, furrowed his brow, and uttered. <laughs> Luca began to laugh uncomfortably. He looked down at his feet. His eyes started back and forth in contemplation. With a sudden pain, a thought struck him.
he sprinted off into the pale distance. As Iggy turned to follow, Nat called out. Chapter 6 The Source Nat expressed his sympathy with a shrug and sauntered off as unassumingly as he'd arrived. He'd given Luca and Iggy what they needed, and nothing more. As Luca sprinted across the snow, the events of the past few days became clearer, pieces to a larger puzzle. Rollo said he was underground somewhere, captured. Mr. Kerr tried to cover it up with lies. The clipboards were hell-bent on capturing Iggy, It all seemed to point to perennial harvest. But right now, there was one thing that Luca needed to know. Luca stopped dead in his tracks. The tree was gone, uprooted and moved, leaving a raw gash in the earth. He dropped to his knees and dug wildly at the cold snow. His numb hands hit something hard, a headstone. A dry whisper escaped Luca's lips. No reply, just snow covered silence. Iggy finally noticed the tears welling in Luca's eyes and the snow covered grave. Suddenly, they heard the crunch of approaching footsteps in the snow. He bent down to scoop up a snowball and lobbed it playfully. through heaving sobs. Iggy gave Luca a solid smack on the back of his head. Luca wiped his eyes with a sleeve. Iggy flashed a mischievous smile 
and cracked his knuckles. shared a skeptical look. <laughs> Iggy darted behind a large pine and began digging furiously. He emerged holding a shoebox with a crude skull painted on its lid. Luca rolled his eyes with realization. Iggy stifled a chuckle. triumphantly raised the shoebox. of the hole with bewilderment in their eyes. Arctic air breathed out of the cavern in heaving gusts. Ha, 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 ha. 
Peggy waved the box into the air, threatening to drop it down the hole. through Luca. Iggy tried to twist away, but in the struggle they both tumbled over the side. Luca dove forward, bracing Iggy's hand just before it slipped. His grip was made precarious by the cold, wet snow. He could see Kerr further down, clinging to Iggy's coat.
choice but to accept Eggie's request. With a quiet blink, Luca watched a teardrop sail down into the howling void. As his fingers slowly gave up, he met eyes with Iggy. The two silhouettes were swallowed by darkness. With a chuckle, Nat turned and walked west. Dumbfounded, Luca followed behind him, trudging through the snow. Every step taking him further away from everyone and everything he knew. And to be continued in Beacon Pines, Pines Harder. Revenge served cold. Second time's a charm? Wait, that's it? This ends with a crummy cliffhanger just when it was getting good? I was even starting to like Iggy. No way. I refuse to be associated with some never-ending parade of sequels. Let's go back and find something more definitive. And in the stillness, he began. After the death of his father, Luca had trouble sleeping. Each night, his mother would sit at the foot of his bed and hum a gentle melody. It was the only thing that could calm his mind. The only thing that, however briefly, could make it all seem okay. That melody pervaded every memory Luca had of his mother. Shivering in the raw snow, he began to hum it out loud. Through a 
flood of tears, she began to hum along, note for note. you know. Seven months ago, Eleanor Van Horn crept down the maze of sterile hallways under perennial harvest. She stopped in front of the large steel door marked Deep Engineering. No turning back now. She raised a trembling hand. The stolen keycard worked as promised, and the door buzzed open with mechanical efficiency. She was immediately hit with the smell of disinfectant. It was some sort of laboratory. In one corner was a desk covered in papers. Across the room stood a tall metal pod with hoses protruding from its base. She rushed to the desk and began shifting through the piles of papers. They were experiment reports on something called Tempus Liquimen. There were dozens of them. Every one stamped, failed. Eleanor heard the sharp echo of footsteps approaching. She was out of time. 
Her eyes scanned the room, eventually landing on the strange pod. Muttering a curse under her breath, she dashed over and dove inside. Mr. Kerr addressed the crowd with a sarcastic tone. Whispers filtered through the crowd. dragged on Joseph Nancrete's face. He paused for a moment, plucking a piece of fuzz from his sweater and discarding it to the ground. motion, he downed its contents. A triumphant smile grew across Solomon's lips. His body and face began to contort and expand as he disappeared into a belching green mist. examined his new hands. (laughs) 
Sharper choked out a crude squawk of a laugh. Frustrated grumbles sprinkled through the crowd. gave a subtle nod to the clipboards. A helpless quiet settled over the crowd. Sharper addressed the crowd with indignant pride. He'd planned this moment for so long that now, at the deed's fruition, it almost felt frivolous. <laughs> Mr. Kerr flourished a preposterously elaborate bow. Sharper coughed up one final laugh and cracked his knuckles. And so, Sharper set about remaking the town in his own image. The fertilizer factory soon reopened for business. Sales rose steadily as more and more farmers across the countryside began to swear by its miraculous properties. Beacon Pines became famous. 
a secretive town that, for the right price, shared its gifts with all. Gifts that became more and more necessary in a world where winters grew longer and longer. The end. This is wrong, but things are becoming clearer now. You can feel it, right? We can't let Sharper win. He might just be the key to this whole thing. Let's see. He didn't know why, but something was telling Luca to get out of there. Luca twisted free of Nuncreed's grasp. Hurried off, eagerly formulating a plan. aired a long holler into the woods. Luca felt his eyes getting heavy and plopped into the beanbag. He conceded to its lumpy embrace. Once again, Luca found himself in a vast black expanse. This time, he knew exactly where to go. He took a single confident step forward. The world flickered and pulsed. He found himself standing in front of the frigid air of a blazing the source. He plopped down cross-legged and gazed into the cold flame. Soon enough, the fire began to die out, popping sporadically until all that was left was a single ember. Luca stood up and dusted himself off. He plucked the glowing ember from the cold ash, examined it, and slid it into his pocket. A keepsake. The voice of his father spoke behind him. You made me proud, Buckaroo. Luca turned to face him. Dad, what is this place? A warm 
grin grew across his father's face. A place where everything that has been and everything that could be all would... Luca found himself staring at his father's face, trying as hard as he could to memorize every single detail. Wait? For what? Another voice spoke out as Luca's doppelganger stepped forward. That's up to you. Without knowing why, Luca began to weep. Is... is any of this real? Are you real? Luca's father bent down to smudge away a tear. Of course, I'm as real as the part of you that misses me. Luca turned to look at the older version of himself. And you? The doppelganger choked back tears. I'm as real as the part of you that's angry he's gone. Does that make sense? Through his tears, Luca laughed. <laughs> I think so. His father pulled him in for an embrace. Time to go, buckaroo. Luca was startled from his dream by a banging on the floor. A commanding voice rumbled from below. Just as Luca sprang to lock the entry hatch, the door knocked open. <laughs> Chapter 5 Dangers Big and Small Luca stumbled back. He heard the rope ladder creak under significant weight. Keeping his eyes fixed on the hatch, he inched backward to the balcony. As his hand grasped the door handle, Luca froze. A large figure clumsily wriggled up through the hole. The large figure cocked its head inquisitively. Luca's jaw dropped. He peered more closely at the man standing in front of him. Something about him was undeniably Rolo, only bigger, older, changed. Rolo proudly presented his hands to Luca. <laughs> Luca moved to the side and pointed Rollo to his reflection in the balcony window. His hands shot up to his face. Rollo shadow boxed a few jabs. Mm -hmm. With a yelp, Rollo dove behind Luca.
a nervous glance at Rollo. Beck's eyes narrowed.
Luca gave Rollo a quick elbow to the ribs. Beck flicked a large sheet of paper out of her pocket and slammed it on the floor. started to wiggle with excitement. Chapter 6 The Heist They spent the night's end huddled around that small map, formulating a plan to infiltrate the headquarters of Perennial Harvest. It would be no small feat, a modern facility equipped with all manner of technology, not to mention the swarm of clipboards that would most certainly be scattered throughout. By the time the sun began to peek through the car window used as a makeshift balcony door, all were in agreement. This could just work. The final day before the festival would be used to prepare. They'd need to pull every resource at their disposal, pull every favor with a thread enlist some unsavory characters around town with important tasks only they were suited for. Luckily, there was enough ill will and mistrust toward perennial harvest that alliances could be found at a bargain. Luca, Beck, and Rollo rubbed their eyes as they exited the treehouse. They hadn't slept at all that night. There was no... The festival was to begin in one day, and they each had their assignments. He waved vaguely at Rollo's sizable figure. Beck snorted an involuntary giggle. each other with sleepy confidence and nodded.
long snicker. <laughs> the joy in Jeff's face drained instantly. <laughs> Looking into the sullen eyes of his would-be accomplice, Luca blurted out the first word that came to mind. wasn't ready to get he shouted out again <laughs> Jeff's brow perked up <laughs> sensing some traction Luca carried on with vigor Jeff's scowl faded with a sigh. One good stomp of the foot was all Jeff needed to drive his point home. Sealed the deal. With a firm and dusty grip, Jeff reciprocated. Suspiciously. Iggy gave a reluctant shrug. Iggy considered the point. Iggy's face. Iggy glanced over to Tish, who nodded in agreement. With a quick nod, Luca was off. Iggy gazed up at Tish with a smile. A single tear ran down Tish's cheek. <laughs> Chapter 7 Into the Hive A good heist requires preparation. And thorough preparation takes time, something they had precious little of. So far, everything was in order. Jeff, Iggy, and Tish all agreed to do their part. Beck radioed Luca that night with a simple and covert message. We are locked and loaded on my end. And Rolo, after a lengthy confession, managed to persuade Roxy and Fitz to help. He stowed away in mission control for the night to avoid attracting attention. Rolo, being uniquely suited for the role, would be the first to breach perennial harvest. The outfit provided by Jeff wasn't perfect, but a convincing disguise is 10% wardrobe, 90% confidence.
Rollo took a few vigorous breaths and shook out his arms. He had to think quick. Rollo sighed, adjusting his tool belt. With a stroke of his mustache, Rollo proceeded into the perennial harvest headquarters. He stammered and flipped through the pages of his clipboard. Rollo interrupted with urgency in his voice. The distraction was enough for Rollo to regain his confidence. The clipboard fumbled around in a frenzy. Solomon stopped in his tracks. A veneer of confusion flashed across Solomon's face. His words rushed out dramatically. <laughs> Solomon's facade briefly faltered. Luca happened to notice a plaque above the door. Luca tried the handle. Solomon leaned forward to examine the mechanism. Luca smiled and looked at his watch. The light on the keypad changed from red to green.
Luca switched on his walkie-talkie. <laughs> on the computer screen, a green cursor blinked in a password field. Luca pecked out his best guess, underground secrets. The screen blinked to life. Columns of green numbers glowed on a black background. Solomon's jaw clenched into a half smile. Luca quickly scanned the columns for number 24601. Once again, Luca scrutinized the numbers on the screen. In that moment of distraction, Solomon reached forward and pressed a large red button. He quickly skimmed the screen with his finger. to examine his teeth. Thank you. 
she held it tightly behind her back. Solomon sighed, speaking in crisp, measured syllables. He pursed his lips with feigned sincerity. A deep uncertainty washed over Beck. She looked to Nellie shakily. With a dispirited nod, Nellie sighed in defeat. Beck slowly approached Solomon. With apprehension, Beck conceded. Solomon pocketed the vial and brushed off his shoulder with a sharp flick. The blood drained from Kerr's face. Solomon shook his head with gratification. A muffled applause resonated faintly through the walls. sounded from the hall. Chapter 8 Comeuppance Ears still ringing, Gran picked herself up off the ground. Through the dust and smoke, she looked over to see Mrs. Fratelli helping Hiram Tolliver to his feet. She'd had to beg, borrow, and steal to acquire those explosives. How many nights had she spent visualizing how she'd use them to make things right? And now, her one shot at destroying the source, that damned hole that swallowed so much of her life, was gone. Traded for this jagged hole in a wall and a foolhardy shot at rescuing Rollo. With Fratelli and Tolliver at her side, she stepped through. It was a strange feeling. 
The last time she'd stalked this maze of hallways, it was in a different body. They quickly rounded a corner to find a group of clipboards guarding a door. Something worth guarding is probably something worth seeing. She leapt forward, brandishing her cane. If her last chance at vengeance for things lost was truly gone, she would just have to fight to keep what she still had. They made their way out from deep within perennial harvest, just as Solomon finished up his speech. <laughs> Solomon pulled a glass vial from his pocket. In one smooth motion, he downed its contents. A triumphant smile grew across Solomon's lips. <laughs> With a mischievous look, Beck elbowed Luca. Remember when I had the vial behind my back? Ida tweaked his wonder potion with a little change. His body and face began to contort and expand as he disappeared into a belching green mist. Eris awkwardly cradled the squirming child. She looked to her brother, her voice shaking with uncertainty. <laughs> She looked back down at the infant with equal parts kindness and terror in her eyes. With a shake of her head, Eris addressed the crowd with a stern scowl. <laughs> Epilogue Beacon Pine's coldest summer on record came and went without much fanfare. Folks shared what they had and none were left wanting. The new school year was ushered in by the falling leaves of autumn. After everything Luca, Rollo, and Beck had been through, middle school was bearable. The chill of winter didn't seem to bother people much. They kindled a hope for a better future in their hearts. When spring arrived, farmers planted their crops with a sense of joy and optimism. And as the dawn of the first day of summer came again, its light slowly spread through the shallow valley. It crept over the town square, across the river, past the neglected welcome sign, and came to rest on a young boy sleeping at dawn. His mind at peace, knowing he is here for a reason. Over time, Eleanor began moving Walt's old things out of the closet and into storage. Eleanor had moved back into her bedroom, and now that she wasn't sneaking out late, she even slept there most nights.
collapsed, most of the clipboards skipped town. But some stuck around and dedicated themselves to making things right. swelling in her eyes. glowed with a carefree smile. Mrs. Fratelli sighed with a zen-like calm.
closing her eyes, Miss Hatch took a deep, relaxing breath. He playfully waggled an apple. Mr. Nuncreed shook his head. With perennial harvest gone, the transportation tubes were left unused. <laughs>
is it. The end I've been waiting for. <laughs> Honestly, I began to lose hope of ever finding it. But then you came along. <laughs> I, I don't know exactly how to thank you. It's hard to explain how much this means to me. It's funny, now that our time together is finally ending. I'm at a loss for words. Let's just watch the end together. Mm-hmm.
I might have tweaked his wonder potion with a little junk. His body and face began to contort and expand as... of what was once sharper valentine wafted into the air the crowd began to disperse still numb from what they had just observed sharper valentine was gone for good his end would be a new beginning for beacon pines a new chance to let go of the things they had lost and grab hold of a new future the end well i'd be lying if i said that wasn't a bit gratifying if that feels to you like a good note to end on, I won't stand in your way. I might have tweaked his wonder potion with a little malice. His body and face began to contort. when William Kerr sprinted off stage and into the distance. He was never seen around Beacon Pines, or anywhere else for that matter, again. Watching the silhouette of Kerr disappear over the horizon, Luca began to laugh. First, a low chuckle that became uncontrolled, heaving laughter. Through his tears, he was vaguely aware that the crowd had begun to laugh with him. The end. That was... unexpected. Perhaps a bit of an absurd ending for my taste, but who am I to say? I'm only writing the damn thing. They'd run the classic good cop Chill cop interrogation. Luca walked calmly to the light switch, flicking it off and on a few times. Mr. Tolliver shook his head, gathering his wits. He looked over to find Luca, who returned a calming grin. Rollo and Beck emerged from hiding to give a timid wave. Luca glanced over to Rollo and Beck, who replied with skeptical looks. Mr. Tolliver exhaled with disappointment. Luca gestured to the corner. Luca looked again to Rollo and Beck. This time they shrugged. Luca began to slowly loosen the bindings. 
Mr. Tolliver gently rubbed his wrists. He edged imperceptibly toward the stairs as he spoke. Before the kids had even noticed his movement, Mr. Tolliver was at the light switch. He punctuated his final words by flicking the switch and rushing up the stairs. Beck darted to the wall and turned back on the lights. It was too late. Rollo confirmed what they all heard. Mr. Tolliver's muffled voice came from behind the door. They looked bewildered at each other. They heard the staccato thump of quick steps exiting the house. The kids looked down in resignation. This isn't how it goes in Hank Atomic. For some reason, they'd always assumed it was up to them to save their town. Luca opened his mouth, hoping to conjure some magical words to make this right. Only a hollow croak escaped. The end. Well, we certainly aren't going to find a grand resolution to our tale locked in a basement. Back to the drawing board. <laughs>